I'm, I'm going to, to talk about uh, uh, heights, three subgroups, and spectral gaps. It's a joint work with Oren Becker, who's in Cambridge now. Um, so uh, so I'd, I'd like to, so in my talk, uh, S will be a generating set, symmetric, so it contains the identity of some group. So S will be finite, and I have finite group, I have a, a and the generated group gamma. Um, and so in, in uh, a previous talk um, by Piotr Novak, we, we heard about cash land concept. So I'm going to, to, define, to define this. So, um, um, so if you have pi as unitary representation of gamma, uh, then you can define k pi, and that's going to be the supremum of all epsilon for which um, for every v in the, uh, for every vector in the representation space, uh, the, um, the max s belongs to s of s v i of s. i of s v minus v um, is bigger than epsilon v. Okay? So, um, and that's a k pi of, of s, depends on s. Okay. And, and so uh, in, with this notation, and gamma has property t, if and only if you can find some, uh, some constant uh, k naught uh, such that uh, k pi is bigger than k naught, for every pi without invariant vector. Without non-zero invariant vector. Okay, so that's property T. The same way you can define uh, amenability. So gamma is not amenable. And that's if and only if uh, K lambda is positive where lambda is L2 of gamma as a regular representation. Um, and this, in the same spirit, you, if you have finite groups these time, and you have a sequence of finite groups, and you look at the KD graph, and this, this family is a family of expanders. Uh, of expanders. Uh, if and only if um, the, there is a k naught such that k lambda n is bigger than k naught uh, for every n, where lambda n is the regular representation uh, minus the constant. So, so this depends, a priori this depends on the generating set. But the fact that it's positive here um, may not, does not depend on the generator. Here, on the other hand, this is quite depending, dependent on the generator. So, um, the same for, for property T, the existence of a K node, uh, a positive K node, um, does not depend on the generating set, but if you change the generating set, the K node may change. So, um, so it's a famous open problem uh, to, de to determine how this may depend on the general. So uh, this open problem, uh, you have this old, uh, it does, so it's when, you know, we, we know that SL3Z has property T, but does SL3Z have a uniform property T? And what this means is that Namely, does there exist a K naught, which would be independent of the generating set, such that uh, K pi of S is bigger than K naught uh, for every pi and for every S, okay? for every pi without invariant vector, and for, for every generating set. Okay, so this is uh, this is an open problem and. Seems that 
um, clearly a new ID needs to be found. Um, yeah. So uh, another another question is um, is the family of all KD graphs uh, all KD graphs of uh, finite simple groups of D type. Uh, of bounded rank, so of rank at most R, or some given R, uh, is this family a family of expanded? Expanders uh, again, this is this is a problem. So what what is known about this is that you can find a family of KD graphs. For each five simple group, you can find a generating set and make this family into a family of expanders. But it's conceivable and conjectured even that you can find you, you, that this is uniform provided the rank is bounded. So as Piotr to told us in his lecture, the symmetry group, the alternating group is not always an expander. It depends on the generating set. So you can find the ordinary generating set does not make it into a family of expanders and you have to work to, to be able to make it into a family of expanders. But if you bound the rank, so let's say SLR of FQ, R is fixed and Q may vary, then, then, uh, then it's a question whether this may be completely unique. Okay. Um, okay, so, so, so these are two questions. And um, yeah, and so this uh, could maybe uh, add the names of uh, Bourga and Gambord who uh, studied expanders and found in the 2000s, uh, 2005 and so on, they, they, they did, uh, they found a new method to construct expanders and to show that uh, KD graphs are expanders. And this has led to a, a small evolution in the subject, and, uh, many new results. Uh, and in particular, um, what people typically looked at uh, back then, and this was uh, explained in the first talk by Eliezer, uh, was when you fix you fix a group gamma and you look at its quotients, standard quotients, and you take this, the the family of um, the generating sets that are given as mod you know that come from the fixed generating set of gamma, and so this is what the situation that people study most. And uh, Alireza, um, together with Peter Varju, they proved. Um, They, they, they proved a fairly uh, definitive result, which says that whenever you have a group gamma, which is Darisky dense uh, in a perfect algebraic group, uh, and you take um, mod p quotients, uh, then then you get a family. Um, and it's conjectured that you can replace p by n by an arbitrary modulus, but this is not completely completely solved. But hopefully, it will be some point, uh, given all the progress that has been done recently. So, but this is still when you fix the generating set above and you take mod, mod P. Reduce. What I suggest here is to, to do something completely uniform. Okay. So, um, um, yeah, so um, f f first result in, in, in this direction is a, is a theorem uh, I proved uh, with uh, Sari Gelander. Almost 20 years ago, and we we showed that um, uh, first of all, any linear group, a linear group, I mean a subgroup of GLD over some field, uh, which is non-immutable, is uniformly non-immutable. is uniformly non-immutable. And so uniformly non-immutable means that um, this K naught over there does not depend on the generating set. Okay, okay. namely, um, so K lambda of S 
is bigger than K naught uh, for every generating set of gamma. So this gamma will be, um, this K naught here will be a K naught of gamma. Uh, the second, second point um, is in fact, uh, how we prove this part one here, we show that there exists some N nodes which depend on gamma only, such that um, for every generating set S, you can find A and B in, that can be expressible as short words in the generating set S, such that AB is a free group. So uh, what's the connection between one and two? And actually, uh, I'll go back over there. Uh, so, um, maybe I should have kept this, okay, never mind. So um, the, po the point is that two implies one, and this is because um, it's easy to see that this Gaussian constant satisfy this inequality. So if you have a vector which is not moved very much by all elements of S, then this element will not be moved very much by all elements of S to the N also. And you have a correcting factor of N naught. This just follows from the definition. So, but then if this is bigger than K lambda of AB, and this here, because this is a free group, and the free group lies in gamma. This just is going to be equal to the Cajun constant for the free group of AB. This is because if gamma has contained the free group, then you can write down the regular representation of gamma as a direct sum of isomorphic representations, which will be the representations of the free group. And for the free group, it's well known, the free group is not amenable. So this is bigger than zero. So this is going to be okay note. And if N note is bounded in terms of independent of, of, of choice of S, then you have something unique. Okay, okay. So, um, so that's the first uh, thing. And a few years later, I was able to improve this and remove that term, I was able to remove the assumption that actually, I mean, to, uh, to show that in fact this N note here does not even depend on the group gamma. So it depends on actually just the dimension. So, uh, in fact, N note depends only on D and not on gamma and not even on the field. Okay, okay so, so I'm, I call this sometimes the uniform, actually it's right there, it's the uniform uh, teats alternative. Because Tietz showed that every linear group, which is not virtually solvable, contains a, a free subgroup. Or in other words, every linear group, which is non immutable contains a free subgroup. And this says that actually, the, the two elements that generate the free subgroup, you can find them, you can express them as words of bounded length in the generator. And this bound depends only on D. So, um, yeah, recently I've tried to um, get precise estimates on these end notes and come up with something which is exponential in D. Hopefully I'll make it, I'm hoping to make it polynomial in D, but it's not completely uh, clear at the moment. So, um, okay. 
so, so what I'm going to, to tell you about, so this is one, two. Uh, what I'm going to tell you today, I want to tell you today is one, three. And, and this is this joint work with, with Oren, where we, we, we go further. So we, we show um, that you have a spectral, uniform spectral gap, um, not only for the um, regular representation of gamma that corresponds to the non-amenability here, but for other representations, those that come from homogeneous phase. So we, we prove, and I call this uh, uniform non-amenability Uh, for homogeneous spaces, okay. So the theorem is the following. So suppose G is a semi-simple, semi-simple algebraic group. Uh, let's say over C, and um, then there exists uh, some kappa which depends only on G. With the following property, which is positive, such that um, kappa note kappa lambda uh, of uh, kappa lambda of S is bigger than K naught um, for so whenever the group generated by S is Zariski dense. And I call this gamma. And lambda is any representation of the form L2 of gamma mod H. And H is not Zariski dense. So you have, in other words, you have non amenability, and this, uni this non amenability is uniform. Uh, over the generating set, but it's also uniform over the the H here. So you you look at functions on homogeneous space gamma mod H, uh, but you cannot take any homogeneous space uh, because, for instance, gamma could be a free group, right? and if you take H uh, an arbitrary normal subgroup, then you would get an arbitrary group here. And of course, they are amenable groups, amenable quotients. So, so you cannot hope to have such a result uniformly over all subgroups of H of gamma. But what I'm saying here that you get, you do get this uniformity provided you restrict to a subclass of, of subgroups of gamma that are not Zariski dense. So you have the geometric condition. And then you have this uniformity. Okay. So, um, so that, that's the theorem, a, a couple of um, uh, consequences of this. So uh, the first consequence is a corollary one for this non-concentration of random walks. Several varieties of so non concentration of random walks. So uh, here we have, we take mu a probability measure on, uh, on G. Okay, so G, G is uh, here, the same G as here, so G is G of C. And uh, I take a probability measure on G. I suppose that the support of mu. Is Zariski dense, and um, using the same notation as in Ali Reza's talk, I will denote by E the minimum of mu of x, where x belongs to the support of mu. Okay, and I assume that this is positive. So mu is finitely supported; it's finitely supported measure, and it generates a Zariski dense subgroup. Okay. Uh, well then, okay, for every integer n, 
And for every proper subvariety, proper algebraic subvariety uh, of G, you have the following uniform estimate. So mu n of V. So mu mu to the power n is the nth convolution power of mu. So it's, it's mu n of V uh, measures the probability that the random walk at time n, when you uh, you walk on the group according to the measure mu, lies in V. So mu to the n of V. This is bounded by something completely explicit. So you have the dimension of V to the power one half. Then you have the degree of V as an algebraic variety. And then you have an exponential estimate. And with a, with a coefficient here, which depends on essentially nothing, depends only on the group, ambient Lie group, and on this E here. In particular, it does not depend on the field of coefficients of the group generated by mu. It does not depend on, on, on mu more than that. By degree of V, that's right. You fix in a fine embedding and then you have And so um, when V is an algebraic subgroup, then this essentially boils down to this theorem. Because when V is, is an algebraic subgroup, then you could take H to be the intersection of this algebraic subgroup and gamma. And what this essentially says um, is that this decays exponentially fast. And that's essentially the same thing as saying that this uniform is lower bound on the Kaizen. So, so, but then there is a, a, a kind of a fairly easy combinatorial trick of using Cauchy Schwarz to, that allows you to, to go from uh, this uniformity on subgroups to uniformity on the optical. So this is the, the first corollary. And, and the, the, the next uh, consequence corollary, corollary two has to do with expanders, this uniform expansion. Um, so, uh, so here we show the following. So we show that for every epsilon, there exists a, a set, let me call it bad epsilon, set of primes. This set might be empty, I don't know, but what I know is that it's small in the following sense. Um, if I count how many primes I have in the interval 1t, then this is at most t to the epsilon. And, and second, uh, the family of all KD graphs uh, of uh, a finite simple group of Lie type uh, of rank at most R. So R is given uh, uh, over a phi. Uh, when P is not in this bad set, uh, this is a family of expanders. Found a family. Okay, so um, some ideas in, in, in the proof of corollary two. Um, so it's not in, it's not really a corollary; it's more like an application uh, of of the previous uh, theorem and of the method developed by Boga and Gembord and Hussain and others. Um, so. Um, but the, the, the punchline here is, is that you get uniformity over all KD graphs, but you may have to exclude a small family of primes. Um, yeah. So the conjecture being that 
maybe bad deep silent does not exist or is giving them. Uh, so, so, so some ideas, so the, the, so how do you go? So this is a statement mod P and while over here we have a statement we are on characteristic zero. So how do you go from characteristic zero to characteristic two? So maybe one, one comment before that, if you have a statement like this, so if you know that this is a family of expanders, another way to, to understand expanders is to, to say that, uh, you know, graph is an expander graph if it's sparse and, and, and very well highly connected. So uh, another equivalent uh, formulation is to say that the, the random walks on the k graph, it redistributes as fast as can possibly be. So in particular, the random walks will not uh, accumulate on any proper sub-variety, on any, any proper sub -variety. So if you have a statement like this, then you can deduce something like this too. Because if you start with an infinite group over G of Q bar, or G of Q, for example, and then strong approximation tells you that it's going to map onto many finite quotients subjectively. If you know these finite quotients are expanders, then you can deduce such a statement. Go back to the original group and deduce that it does not accumulate on several. Okay, so this is typically a stronger statement than that. And but what we do is the opposite. We first prove something uh, the characteristic zero, and we deduce the characteristic p as a consequence. And this is done by uh, uh, just a very general principle. Um, I mean. Strategy is a very general principle that, you know, first order logic statement, uh, if, it, if you have a first order logic statement phi, and if it holds uh, over C, then it holds uh, over FP, provided P is sufficiently large, bigger than some pi note, uh, that depends on the so this is general fact. Um, for example, if, 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 so uh, that, that's a very completely general fact, uh, and which essentially reduces to some effective Newton's ads. So if you have a Newton's ads, you can write down the equation. If you have a family of polynomials and they don't have a common zero, over a, over C, then you can write down one as a linear combination of these polynomials. But these polynomials, they will have um, coefficients in Q. So for some P large enough, if you can control the denominators, then the statement will make sense. Okay, so that's essentially what they say. Right. But here, what's first order, what, what, what would be that statement? So that statement would be something like the negation of this. So it will, it will look like um, you know, something like for too many, too many words, W. So what does it mean that the probability uh, mu to the n of V is not too small? So it means that there are many words that fall in V. Okay? So this would mean that for too many words, W with letters in S, uh, then W lies, lies in V. And if that's the case, so that's a negation of this exponential estimate. Then if that's the case, then in fact, well, the only, re the only possibility for this to, to fail is that one of the assumptions fails. But okay, is, is given. So the, the, the only assumption that can fail is this Zariski density. So this would mean that, that the group generated by S is not Zariski dense. Uh, but being Zariski dense in, in, in Zariski open is an open condition on the general. So not being Zariski dense is can be can be seen as um, you know it can it can be detected. Uh, it's it's a Zariski closed condition, so it's honest. So so this this is a first order logic statement in the language of physics. So then you can reduce it mod p, and when you reduce it mod p you get a statement that hints into this direction, 
But of course, to be able to say something meaningful, you need to be able to say something meaningful on the p-node. So you need an effective bound on this p-node. Uh, so, so the ingredients that you need are uh, effective nodes and that. And, but we, we need more than this. Really, what, what we need is to, is to develop an effective uh, uh, elimination theory over Z. So we, we, we wrote uh, an appendix, which became a separate paper, but uh, that to, to, to develop this effective elimination theory, which, you know, you have to work with a Gro you use Grobner basis and, and, and then prove a uh, completely effective and polynomial in the degree estimate for, for um, uh, Grobner basis that, um, of the ideals that arise uh, here in the setting. So, um, yeah, so it, re it, it, it uh, requires quite a bit of work. And when you do this, you realize that this P note is not quite good enough to show that these are expanders for all P. And this is why we have to remove this finite, this, this small uh, set of primes, uh, um, because the, the, the P note may be a bit too large. Uh, so you, yeah, you have to, to, to realize here that the, these statements, you know, they, they, so the words we have to look at here, they are words of large n, or of large length, length n. So the corresponding word varieties will have large degree. They, they will have degree uh, depending on n, typically degree n. So um, although the dimension is fixed, the degree is very high. And so we need to, that's why we have, uh, it's crucial to, uh, to do this effectively and to have effective bounds. Okay, so that's just one. Um, uh, glimpse of what, what what we do, and um, and now I'm going to tell you uh, some some ingredients that go into the proof of, of theorem three. So, um, so ideas for theorem three. Okay, so. Uh, it's a little bit as in the T's alternatives. So there, there are two steps. So there's a geometric step and there is an arithmetic step. Um, so um, in the T's alternative, the geometric step is um, based on this idea of ping pong. So you, you, you have to find a suitable representation of your group, linear representation, and you have to exhibit um, a pair of elements that play ping pong on this projective, on the projective space of that linear representation of the simple loop ambient region. Uh, so here, uh, it's a bit different because we um, don't just find a three subgroup. We want, so we, we, uh, what we, the, the dream would be to find a free subgroup that has a property that whenever you intersect it with a non zariski dense subgroup, it's abelian. So these are called strongly dense free subgroups. A strongly dense free subgroup is a subgroup where um, uh, the, inter the intersection with any proper algebraic subgroup is a B. Okay. Um, and they exist, but they're hard to construct. And we don't know whether or not, for example, the T's alternative um, uh, works. So whether you can always find a strongly dense free subgroup in a given uh, Zariski dense subgroup. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, um, we can still manage to prove this theorem because we don't, we're not shooting really for a strongly dense free subgroup, but we shoot for something, for something a bit weaker, which is this uh, um, uniform spectral estimate. And so for this, uh, there's a, a new, um, we, we have a, 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 what we call a ping pong type lemma, which is, looks a little bit like the ping pong lemma, but it's a bit different. Uh, and it does not generate free subgroup, but it gives you a, a spectral estimate. So uh, the following, this is a setting, the set, setting the following, you have a group and it acts on a set X. And you suppose that you're given elements gamma one, gamma K and gamma. 
and you're given um, some regions, some subsets, uh, A, I, R, I, next. And you assume that, first of all, that uh, gamma I sends the complement of R, I inside A, I, or every I, one, okay? And you assume, second, that the, uh, yeah, you assume that the A, the Ri's and the Ai don't have too much overlap. So when you sum pointwise the indicator functions of Ri and Ai, you, this is bounded by something, some bound n. So, and then the, the consequence of this is that then, then you get a bound on Cajun constant of S, where S is this is the set gamma one gamma k. And this Cajun constant is bounded by one minus square root of M over K. So, uh, yeah, so this is very general. It's the proof is a bit similar to the three point gamma. Um, but the main, uh, the main point for those of you who are familiar with the ping pong is, is that in, in our case, we are going to, uh, to apply this with K uh, much larger than M. And with the AIs and the RIs will be neighborhoods uh, of subspaces in some suitable projective space of some suitable representation uh, of G. Uh, so, in, as soon as k is bigger than m, then this is this is big. So you have this. Okay. What is lambda here? Uh, lambda is the representation L two of x, where you know this is x. You use x as a discrete space. Okay, so there's no no topology. This is an abstract lemma. Um, no, it doesn't have to. Um, but same. Uh, it's the same for the Cajun constant. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's, the, that's the lemma. Um, M here, w w the, the point of, of this, is this M here um, is bounded and it's going to be bounded in terms of the group itself, only in terms of the dimension, in fact, of the, of the, the representation. Um, uh, the, the, the idea being that Typically, when you try to play ping pong, you have hyperplanes, but hyperplanes intersect. And but you can you you can arrange you can arrange that the hyperplanes don't intersect too much, they don't not too much overlap, and that's what happens in a generic situation. Then you're going to have a, a bound, okay? and therefore you're going to have a bound on the, on the Cajun constant. So, um, all right, and so this this lemma will be applied to to this situation. Uh, where um, uh, the the H, so the, the linear representations, there will be far too many linear representations that will show up um, uh, that correspond to maximal, to conjugacy classes of maximal uh, proper algebraic subgroups. So, um, yeah, so that's the, the geometric step. So the arithmetic step, on the other hand, uh, is, is similar to what uh, was done before for the, uh, uh, for the theorem two, uh, for this uniform Matisse alternative. And so this uses heights. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, 
maybe I'll say one comment first is that uh, in this in this setting here, I'm over C, but essentially bec because of this reason here that uh, you have a first order logic statement that controls what you're doing, uh, it's actually enough to do it over your Q bar. Okay. So uh, if you have a statement like this over C, it holds over C if and only if it holds over Q bar because everything is defined over Q. Words are defined over Z even, even if you put uh, a Z structure on, on your ambient semi-simple uh, regroup. So, um, so it's enough to do everything over Q bar and that's, that's essential. And when you are over Q bar, then you can define the veil height of a number. So if you have a number X in Q bar, the veil height of X uh, uh, is, uh, it's, it's a measure of the arithmetic complexity of your number. So you can write it like this. It's the sum, it's the sum of all places of the number field in which X belongs of NV of local contributions and uh, NV here is the uh, local degree. Uh, and that holds if, if X belongs to number field K. Okay. And the uh, interesting thing about this quantity is that it does not depend on the field in which, uh, on the field here, K. So if you go to an extension, it's going to give you the same number. And also, um, yeah, so also this, this number is, is, is not negative. So, um, so H of X is not negative. Uh, it's, it behaves well when you take a power, so it's really defined on the, on the force on GM. When for an integer. Um, uh, and besides H of X equals zero, if and only if X is a root of unity, Um, and uh, furthermore, you have, you can control the height of the product. Uh, so it's sub-additive like this. And you can also control the height of the sum. Uh, so there is this height calculus in some sense in which, which allows you to give up a bound on the height of any algebraic expression in terms of the, the height of the, um, the numbers that appear in the expression. Uh, so it's very handy, and um, and I'll state uh, um, I'll state the, the, one of the main theorem and ingredients here, which is what I call the height gap theorem. Uh, which um, goes to the way back, and it shows the following: so there exists silence, which depends only on D, and there exists also some len, which depends only on D, with the following property. So if S is a subset of D or D to bar, and you assume that the group generated by S is not virtually solvable, so there is no solvable subgroup of finite index, Then, uh, then um, the, you can find an element, so the, the max over the elements in S to the N, of this N node here, of the height of some eigenvalue of G is at least epsilon. So, Namely, if the group you generate is not virtually solvable, then you, can, you will be able to find a short word in S with an, L, with, um, with an eigenvalue of height bigger than zero. Not just bigger than zero, but actually bounded away from zero, but something uniform. In particular, you'll be able to find an element with an eigenvalue different from zero, and therefore an, a, a non-torsion element. So you'll be able to find an element of infinite order. Okay? And in fact, this, this, uh, this, show, this holds, or this proves uh, the following. The following um, 
Gone are you, actually, I call the video. Effective Shaw theorem. You know, Shaw proved in the early 20th century that you have a finitely generated linear group, then it's, uh, if it's, if it's infinite, then, um, then it has an element of infinite order. But uh, more is true. So there is N, depends only on D, such that if S belongs to DLDC, so S here is just any finite set containing the density, uh, then the fact that the group is infinite already implies that you can find an element of finite order, of infinite order uh, in expressible as a short word, uh, an element of infinite order. Okay, so, so it follows immediately from the theorem when you see we space by Q bar and when the group generated is non-virtually solvable, but in the virtually solvable case, you, it's much easier to prove it very easily by different means. And, um, and, and then you can go to the complex numbers. That's not the case. Thank you. Yep. So that, that holds. And I'll finish by um, uh, stating, an, another ver stating another version of, the, of this uh, high gap theorem, uh, where, which is actually the version first in the paper, which is that, um, which has to do with heights on character varieties. So if you have, if, now let me go back to the matrices. So if you have a finite set of matrices S in, in D of Q bar, then you can define a height on the matrices. And the way you do this is you take the maximum of the operator norm of the elements of S, and you define in the same way, you define H of S to be the sum of local contributions. Okay. And then uh, you, so that defines the notion of height on the, on the finite set of matrices. And then you can define the, 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 what I call the normalized height, which hat of S which is defined in a similar way as, let's say, the Néron-Tate height. So what you do is you look at powers of S, and you take H to the power S to the N, you renormalize by N. And that, that is well defined. This is the normalized height, and, and if you think about it, you'll see it's easy to see that it's conjugation invariant. So it's conjugation invariant height, so actually it's a height on the character variety of the free group with values in G, so in G to the, to the power of the size of S. And it's got lots of nice properties. So um, it's, um, so first of all, it's less, it's always less than the height. Uh, then it uh, behaves well when you take powers. Uh, it's conjugation invariant. is in GLDQ bar. Okay. And, and so, and finally, um, if you have a reductive group G over Q bar, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not zero if and only if the group generated by S, uh, if you're in GLD, is, um, it is zero if and only if the group generated by S is virtually unipotent. Okay. And, so if you have a, a reductive group, um, you take a faithful representation of G, okay? then you define H sub rho as H composed with rho. And, and then finally, you have the following uh, theorem, P5. Um, so, um, so there exists constant C, constant epsilon, and then which depend only on D, such that uh, if the group generated by S, so S is in G of Q bar, and there is Kudens in there, uh, then first of all, H hat rho of S is bigger than epsilon, 
and the two, and you can actually control the um, uh, you can control the you can find an element g in g of q. So you can conjugate everything back so that the height you see the height is always at least the, the normalized height, but uh, but you can make sure that actually you can conjugate so that it's it's comparable. So in this setting, the the normalized height is comparable to this to the infimum of all over all conjugates of, of the set S of the the height S. And so, um, yeah, the, 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 this is the key point. And once you have this, then you can prove the existence of a, um, an element with large angle. Of that set. So, I yeah, I so here, I, I think I, 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 yeah, I need a short, I need to be able to take inverses. So you said something about the effective uh, Neustern that's and uh, effective yeah. elimination uh, over Z. So effective notion that uh, amounts to the computation of Grubner basis, and you said That's something right. about polynomial time algorithms. That's right. So can you say something more about it? Because usually, like yeah, those so algorithms are exponential. Yeah. So we, we we need to prove bounds that are polynomial in the degree. So we need to find bounds on the size of the coefficients of the Grubner basis. So first of all, the degrees can be bounded. Polynomial in the degrees of the original idea, uh, of the generators of the original idea, and 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 the size of the coefficients should also be poly polynomially bounded. The height should be polynomially bounded in terms of the original height. So this requires a little bit of work, and uh, and we, we are using some recent developments of the basis algorithm. So, I mean, most of these, I mean, the, the, you have to work over Z. This, this is what. Are there any other questions? So, I just wanted to ask what more do you need to, to uniform expansion for large finite space? Yeah, so. Do you need to get around the first order logic statement? Or? Yeah, so at the beginning, I was hoping this would uh, be this would, make, this would do it, but, but the, the bounds on the effective notion thus are not quite good enough to, to get you for all p. Uh, and it's not just a bug of, I mean, it's not, it, I mean, they are, it, the, the, these bounds are sharp somehow. Okay? You, you can find polynomial, you can find ideals and polynomials with, for which the bounds in the, the known bounds in the effective notion thus are sharp. So. We cannot improve on this, but it might be the case that for our particular situation, this these bounds can be improved. But uh, this, maybe we should use exploit some ran the randomness to, to, to get where 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 we would like to go. But yeah, we will. I I had one question in your result about uniform expansion. Talked about this bad set of primes. Right. You think they're there? No, we think they are not there. We think we think it's empty. What analytic results are you using to bound the size of the bad primes? Okay. Um, um, not nothing really, you know, apart from the, the yeah, just yeah, nothing really. We just, it's uh, we, we're counting. We, we we use the the bounds of the effective notions that, and this gives a bound, and, uh, and and that's good enough. Yeah, we we use the fact that not too many. So if you 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 may have some bad equ so you have what happens is you have many equations, and uh, some of them may be bad because the effective notions that would give you a that does not reduce well not p uh, but um, but the number of p's for which um, there are too many bad equations that'll be too big basically they have too many primes their product is uh, is very large so there's no yeah, there's no uh, ingredient here um, the, the, the in, for the height gap then the the, the ingredients are um, Bilou's theorem and and um, Jang's theorem of small height. Yeah. 
as well. That's where the exciting comes. Uh, can you say more on what you call strongly free groups? Uh, yes. So, I mean, the definition is uh, free, f f strongly dense free group is a free group, which is Zarsky dense. And every non abelian subgroup is also Zarsky dense. Okay. And um, uh, you have conjecture? Or? So we have a conjecture, which is take the Zarsky dense subgroup in a simple algebraic group, and it contains a strongly dense cluster. Prove this, but in some cases, so, which are so, um, we have to use your theorem uh, on the cone, you know, okay. uh, so we can do it for split R groups. 